Welcome. Thank you for your interest in learning more about federally qualified health centers and community health centers. We're pleased that you can join us. My name is Ashley Caldwell, and I'm the Vice President of Clinical Services and Workforce Development with the Illinois Primary Healthcare Association. Today, I will talk you through the different aspects of what required um, is required to be a federally qualified health center and what services they provide and who they serve. So um, IPHCA, we are non-for-profit uh, state trade association. So we are made up of a membership base that consists of the community health centers across Illinois. We are also um, federally funded um, through the Health Resources and Services Administration, and they are also um, the same bureau that funds the community health centers. So who we represent? Our members are the federally qualified health centers and community health centers across Illinois. We have nearly 400 clinic sites serving primary care, oral health, mental health, um, SUD treatment, and specialty sites all across Illinois. We also have sites in Missouri and Iowa. Our Illinois health centers serve 1.4 million patients annually. So we have a tremendous patient base here in Illinois. FQHCs are nonprofit organizations serving mostly Medicaid, Medicare, uninsured, and also privately insured patients. You'll often hear FQHC and community health centers used interchangeably. The main difference is that an FQHC receives federal funding. FQHCs are funded under the HRSA 330 Health Center Program. So some of the services that we provide to community health centers, uh, we provide advocacy, um, we lobby for health centers, um, we've passed very strong health uh, care legislation over the past few years, we help them with their health professional shortage area designations. We do clinician recruitment where we actually recruit their physicians, their dentists, their nurse practitioners, their behavioral health providers to work in their clinics. Um, we provide group purchasing um, services and discounts for um, purchasing medical equipment, different supplies, um, a lot of training and education. So um, we host trainings um, regularly. So in our Springfield headquarters, we have a training center um, where pre-COVID we were hosting um, trainings several times a month for our community health center staff. Um, and now we've pivoted to a virtual environment. So we are hosting um, many webinars regularly for our clinics. We also spend a lot of time working on quality improvement, um, looking at um, their quality indicators, um, stratifying data, and really trying to identify areas of need uh, within the community health centers. Uh, we also provide help with their financial services, so answering questions around billing, um, different um, issues with um, their you know, revenue streams. So we do provide a lot of financial assistance to them. Um, emergency preparedness. Um, so pre-COVID, again, we were doing a lot of disaster preparedness. Um, we now have been working um, very uh, much on COVID-19. Um, many of our community health centers were some of the frontline um, testing sites and some of the first testing sites, especially in the Chicago area, um, that were really accessible to the communities they serve. Um, so really being leaders um, in, in the um, COVID-19 testing, um, and we expect to be also um, leaders as mass vaccination sites as well. We provide help to them around risk management. Um, so being a federally funded organization, there is a lot of requirements um, around risk management, compliance, um, quality. Um, so we really try to help them understand um, what's expected of them and what the requirements are. We have a lot of very strong oral health programming within Illinois. So we do a lot of work um, around oral health services and integrating oral health into primary care. Um, and finally, we help with outreach and enrollment. So um, enrolling patients in health insurance is such an important um, service. And so we try to help the health centers understand how their patient navigators um, can help serve their communities better. So what are FQHCs? So I mentioned they are called Federally Qualified Health Centers. So they earn that title um, by going through an application process. So you can't just decide, hey, I wanna be an FQHC. Um, there is a process to go through and you have to apply to get that funding. So there are limited numbers um, each year that are open. So there are a lot of clinics um, that are on the path to becoming an FQHC. 
but to be an FQHC, you have to provide services to a patient regardless of how they're going to pay. So when an uninsured patient comes into your clinic, um, that payment that you're going to request from them is determined on a sliding fee scale. And all health centers have to have a sliding fee scale. Your sliding fee scale for primary care is totally different from your primary, um, from your, I'm sorry, from your dental um, sliding fee scale, because we understand that the services and the costs in both of those departments are different. So every health center sets their own fee scale. Um, but if you have a patient come in and you're asking for $10 to see the doctor, they don't have $10, they're still going to be seen. So they're not a free clinic and there's a lot of misconceptions around that. Every reasonable attempt is made to collect payment. However, if a patient cannot pay, they will not be turned away. Patients can be turned away for a host of other reasons, but it cannot be payment related. So requirements of an FQHC. So as a clinic, if you've gone through the process and you've earned um, the title of being an FQHC, um, obviously you're a not-for-profit, 51% uh, of your board actually have to be uh, patients. So patient representation is a huge part of it. So not only are you giving patients from your community um, a chance to serve in a professional capacity on a board of directors, um, you're also having that patient representation um, you know, at the table when you're making decisions. So this is probably one of the most unique uh, requirements of a federally qualified health center. Um, this can be especially difficult for clinics that serve large patients of uh, large numbers of homeless patients, large numbers of migrant farm workers. Um, so sometimes health centers, you know, have to be really creative and do a lot of um, patient outreach, you know, to get members on their board. Um, so it's really interesting. So you could have a patient, and we've had this happen where, you know, there could be a patient who at some times in their life has been homeless sitting next to, you know, a vice president from a hospital, a bank president. So you have um, a very um, interesting mix of people on these boards, which I think is just also such a great thing, um, is that you are getting such different perspectives. So that's so important to the health centers. No one is denied services on their inability to pay. They have to provide the full scope of primary care, which does include OB services. So the majority of our health centers deliver their own babies. Um, they um, can admit to the hospital. They follow their patients to the hospital. Um, so all of those things are, are part of being an FQHC. They have to be providing at least preventative dental services. Um, about 80% of our clinics have their own dental uh, services so that it, it doesn't become an issue for many of them. But the few that don't have dental um, have to have referring relationships to a dentist in their community. Um, they also have to have relationships with hospitals. Like I said, they have to be able to admit their patients somewhere. So you can't just be a, sta a freestanding clinic with no connections to your uh, medical community. So many of our health centers have admitting privileges um, to multiple hospitals. Um, so that is definitely an important part. They also have to be able to refer a patient who needs um, specialty care. So if a patient comes in and they need to see a cardiologist, they need a colonoscopy, um, the FQHC has to develop those relationships within their community to refer that patient for that service and to refer them to a provider who also will honor that they need it on a sliding fee scale. Um, so the health centers negotiate a lot of those rates um, with these um, specialty uh, practices. So they also have to have um, quality improvement programs. So this is a huge part of being federally funded. Um, all of their quality data is public. So you can go out and find all of the um, public uh, clinical data for these community health centers. Um, so the quality is really, really huge. Um, they also have to be providing mental health services. Um, the majority of our clinics are doing this now along with SUD services. Um, so this has been a huge growth area for us. And then finally, they have to be in a health professional shortage area. So what is a shortage area? Um, if you're interested in the loan repayment programs, these health professional shortage areas, or as we call them HIPSAs, um, will become really important when you do your job searching. And we will talk about that um, in a later um, section. So a primary care shortage area, they're gonna count the number of physicians in an area to a population. They look at infant mortality rates, poverty percentage of the patients um, below poverty level, 
um, travel time. So how long does it take for that person to actually access care? Um, and they put that together in a formula. So for primary care, 25 is the most needed. Zero is obviously, um, there's not a shortage. Um, most of our health centers are gonna fall in the high teens to mid twenties. Um, and most of Illinois is going to also fall into that category. So um, really Illinois, um, almost the entire state is considered a shortage area. Um, so that's something to consider. So um, definitely, and, and even when you think about um, maybe wealthier areas, there will still be pockets of underserved within those areas. Um, so again, there's different categories, primary care, dental, and mental health HIPSAs. So services that are provided at FQHCs, obviously they're providing primary care, OB services, well child visits, immunizations. Um, we will definitely be seeing a lot of um, immunization um, vaccine clinics um, to address COVID-19, um, dental services, uh, behavioral health, mental health, SUD treatment. Um, again, OB, we have some health centers that um, have really started to expand and offer some really unique programming. We have a health center um, in the Chicago area who operates a freestanding birth center out of their FQHC. They were the first in the nation to do that. Um, so patients can deliver in a home-like environment. So um, our FQHCs look at their communities, they see what the needs are of the patients and they can adapt to that and provide the services that their patients are asking for. Many of them have their own labs, mammography, you know, all of that on site. Um, contract pharmacies, so a lot of them have pharmacies on site that could be a pharmacy they contract with, they could operate their own, um, but uh, they also do work with you know, Target, Walmart, Walgreens, um, they work with those as their contract pharmacies. Um, they're doing a lot of case management, uh, helping with patient transportation, outreach and enrollment. So helping patients navigate the health insurance uh, system, understanding if they're eligible for Medicaid, um, a lot of patient education. This is probably, you know, one of the areas that I think, um, you know, a health center really is looking at total overall health and wellness. And education is a huge piece of that. So some of the clinics have built mock grocery stores um, filled with, you know, toy food, um, fake food, um, where a patient can actually come in and pretend they're in the grocery store and, and a, um, a diabetes educator, a nutritionist, um, someone can actually go through and teach them how to read food labels, how to shop for healthy food, you know, buy this, don't buy that. Um, they do a lot of cooking classes. Um, we have yoga, um, aerobic centers, fitness classes. Um, so really a lot of unique ways to bring health and wellness to their communities. So some of the benefits and why a clinic would want to be an FQHC is they do get some federal grant funding. This is by no means enough to completely support their clinic. This is just a piece of the pie for them, but it does help um, you know, allow them to do other things um, and, and give them some extra funding. They get higher Medicaid rates, um, and then all of their providers, all of their staff are covered with malpractice insurance um, through the Federal Torts Claim Act. And this is a, FTCA is a federal program. So this is actually a malpractice insurance program for federal employees. Um, however, every FQHC can receive this for their uh, clinical staff. Um, you're not a federal employee, you're actually a, an employee of your health center. So um, it's just a really great benefit and it offers that protection. So you are completely protected um, for all the time that you spent at your health center. So if you leave, you know, and several years later a suit is brought, you're protected from the time you spent at your clinic, obviously as long as you were practicing within the scope um, of the clinic and your license. Um, but it's a really, really great uh, benefit, and it really um, is appealing to a lot of uh, providers as well. Um, and then they also do participate in the 340B uh, drug discount program. So a nationwide perspective, because we know that not all of the health professionals that we come into contact with are from Illinois or potentially will stay in Illinois. So we like to give a national perspective. We have nearly 1,400 FQHC sites serving 28 million patients um, at those 10,000 um, delivery sites. So about 1,400 FQHCs with about 10,000 delivery sites. 
Um, there are FQHCs in all 50 states, um, several territories, and really nationally, we now can say that we um, in the FQHC system are serving one in 12 individuals for their primary care. Um, and that drills down even more to one in six on Medicaid, one in three low income uninsured, and one in five rural Americans. Um, so most patients do not know um, that they're going to an FQHC. They don't know that there is anything different about their clinic probably than that it's their local doctor's office and that they can get all the care that they need um, without judgment, you know, linguistically appropriate um, and without, you know, um, a patient maybe who um, doesn't have documentation, um, they're not going to be asked for any of that. So it is a safe place. Um, and it, it is a, one of the, the few places where they can get high quality care. Um, so really, you know, the goal is to decrease emergency room visits um, and really increase, um, you know, a patient's health and wellness and, and save the healthcare industry money. So um, it's average that community health centers save the healthcare system about $24 billion. Um, and so that is, I mean, that's huge. So health centers really have had very strong bipartisan support um, because it's hard to argue with a system that provides care to those who need it most. So um, the economic impact. So for every $1 of federal funding our clinics receive, we generate almost $6 back into our communities. So that's between people um, staying healthy so they can go to work, get a paycheck, spend that money in their community, uh, we generate jobs because we're hiring people for our health centers um, and we're keeping people out of the ED. And so in Illinois, our economic impact is about $2.4 billion. So community health centers are also um, known as patient center medical homes. And this is an accreditation that they can work toward earning. Um, and they can do this through the Joint Commission. They can do this through, through the National Center for Quality Assurance. Um, and it is a timely process. They have to put a lot of work into this accreditation, um, but it's, it's so important. Um, and it's important um, to the federal government that they become patient center medical homes. So about 80% of our health centers have gone through the process to earn this accreditation. Um, and essentially what this is, is this is um, a medical home that's coordinating all the care. So it's really team-based. So you can have your physician, your social worker, you know, maybe a patient educator, a pharmacist, a dentist, they're all working together on a team. So they can talk to one another about the patients, um, that communication is there, um, and really patient outcomes are improved drastically in patient center medical homes. Um, we're starting to see more private practices become patient center medical homes, um, but really this movement really began in the FQHCs about 10 years ago. Um, so this is um, really an important accreditation. So this is just, again, a snapshot with some of the things we've already talked about, the economic in, um, impact are listed here. Um, one in nine Illinois residents get their care at an FQHC. Um, so again, I think it just shows um, a little bit of, a, of the grand scheme um, of what we're providing here in Illinois. I also like to throw up a map of where our sites are located because I think it also helps to visualize and understand um, where our clinics are located. And you may not realize that you have a clinic, you know, in your county, in your town, um, because again, a lot of people don't know, um, you know, that that clinic down on the corner is an FQHC. Um, so we always like to share this information. So this is Illinois, um, excluding Cook County. And then this is just Chicago. Um, Cook County also has some outlying clinics in the county them itself, but um, the bulk of our health centers, about half are located within the city of Chicago. So as you can see, um, almost the entire city um, is really well covered with FQHC sites. So a few facts about community health centers. So when there is a community health center um, in a city, in a county, infant mortality rates can be reduced by up to 40%. So women are getting that routine care. They can get them in during their pregnancy and um, try to reduce low birth weight, infant mortality. Um, women, so and especially um, uninsured and underserved women, 
um, are getting more routine care. So they're getting their pap smears, they're getting their breast exams, things that would probably go, they'd be going without if there weren't an FQHC in their community. Um, about 93% of the health centers were meeting or exceeding at least one of the Healthy People 2020 goals. Um, so now we'll be resetting and looking at our 2030 goals. Um, but we know we have a lot of health centers that are already um, well on their way to meeting and exceeding those goals as well. And then um, the White House Office of Management and Budget has continually ranked health centers as one of the 10 most effective government programs. Um, so again, a lot of strong bipartisan support uh, for our community health centers. Who do community health centers in Illinois serve? So 72% of our patients are minorities. 95% of our patients have incomes at or below the federal poverty level. 57% of our patients are Medicaid. Uh, about 7% are Medicare. We still have around 20% of our patients that are uninsured. This number has uh, been dropping um, since the Affordable Care Act, but are, we still are hovering right around 20%. Again, this is down from probably high 30s. Um, so we have brought that number down, but we still have about 20% of our patients with no health insurance. And then about 15% of our patients are privately insured. So you can come to the health center with your private insurance um, and be seen as well. So um, any payment type is welcome. So FQHCs nationwide, again, 28 million patients. Um, you can see since 2009, um, we were at 17 million. So again, a lot of growth. Um, the bulk of our patients are still medical. Um, dental though is really on the rise as more and more of our health centers expand their dental services. Um, mental health, I, I think this number is going, we are going to see a huge drop. Um, all of this is 2018 data because um, essentially we're always a year to two behind, you know, as we tabulate all the data, but um, this is going to experience a huge growth um, in the mental health, um, enabling services, SUD treatment, um, and then, then vision services. That is a really up and coming service um, within the FQHCs um, and a very important service in um, underserved communities who often don't have access to getting their patients glasses, um, getting those, um, their diabetic patients, getting them in for, you know, vision screenings. So um, vision services is really important as well. So nationwide, um, very close to the Illinois numbers, 21%, or I'm sorry, 22% uninsured, 71 low the poverty level. Um, nationwide Medicaid numbers are a little bit lower than ours. Um, and then nationwide, a little bit lower um, for minorities. Um, and then about 24% of patients nationwide are best served um, in a language other than English. So providing that linguistically appropriate care is also incredibly important um, within the community health centers. So I wanna thank you for learning a little bit today with us about what are FQHCs, and we look forward to speaking more with you. Thank you.